Yeah. And no, the, the summit replay is this weekend. It was last week, but it did really well. And I'm going to mention how great your talk was as soon as oh, I. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest has been on the show before. He's one of our more popular guests, or most popular. Not that our other guests are unpopular, it's just that he comes on a lot because he's always got something new and exciting to say, and he answers your questions. It's always best to send them in because then you get priority because whenever we have a doctor on the show in general, but Dr. Lyle on in particular, there's a lot of questions. If you haven't seen his interview in the Truth About Weight Loss Summit, we have a free replay weekend. I'll put a link there. You've got to see his talk because he he answers one question about self-esteem that he just goes into such detail. Even if you don't have a weight problem, you have to listen to this talk. And we're so honored that he's joining us today. He comes on about once a month when he's available. And he is the co-star of the Beat Your Genes podcast, which is fantastic. You must listen to it. They have, I think, over 250 episodes now. He, now he does that with Dr. Jen Hawk, who also comes on the show when she can. And he's, of course, the co-author of The Pleasure Trap, which is a must read. Please welcome Dr. Doug Lyle. I love hey, him. AJ. I, it's so fun talking to you. It's like, I, I just, I mean, I wish we could have Lyle TV all the time. I mean, I, 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 24 hours a day would not be enough. Well, we got the technology. We survived again. <laughs> people, don't know, people don't know how incompetent I am with technology. So AJ has to like save my, save my whatever. I was going to say save my bacon, but we don't do, we don't say that for uh, right. the vegan world. And the thing is, is, you know, you're not a disagreeable person, but I, I got to say that when it doesn't work, it, it, it does bring out that side of you. You get very frustrated with it when it doesn't work. <laughs> very true. That's the only time I see you not smiling is when, yeah. is when technology doesn't work. So uh, yeah, my, my friend, Alan, his, where he is completely incompetent is in directions. <gasps> and so the, he, he can't find his way out of a wet paper bag and I can't make technology work. So that. <laughs> I remember that time when you guys were coming to the conference in Topang and it was really late at night and he got, I remember he, he, he gets, he gets lost. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Nice. All right. Okay. You know, I'm not seeing anybody in the chat. So I just, I wonder if this is, is anybody there? Usually we've got so many people. Let me just double check. Wouldn't that be funny? Well, at least it's recording. So, you know, yeah. that's good news, but it's always nice when somebody says something. Wow. Ah, there they are. Just a yep. little bit of a delay. Hi, Karen. Hi. Oh boy. Phew. Okay. All right. Good. So anyway, good. so uh, let's get, let's jump into the questions and some of them are really interesting. Now this first one from Mindy, it's like, I could have written this question. So bless you, Mindy. She says, dear Dr. Lyle, I am a health coach and I hang on every word you say. When I am counseling clients, I always hear your voice in my head. We must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves. Yet very few people seem willing to do this. I actually had a client this week that said to me, I would rather have gastric bypass surgery than to tell my husband he can't eat pizza in the house or buy my kids cookies. How can I impart your wisdom that the environment is critical to success to my clients? And why is there such resistance to cleaning it up and how can I help them want to do this? I think that's a very good question. Um, I think probably the first way you're going to do this is you're going to uh, explain it as an experiment. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get it, you know, past the husband and the kids, et cetera. So, we're, and, and you may need to start with a small experiment and a, and a legitimate experiment would be say two weeks, okay? So that's, that's how we're going to I uh, get them to take a shot at this. And the truth is, is maybe they'll do it or maybe they won't. So we say, well, why don't we try an experiment for a couple of weeks and, uh, and just see if we can get the, the family on board. It's like a little life adventure. Uh, we're just going to see, it's going to be, we're going to pretend like we've gone back to the, the olden days before, you know, uh, before McDonald's and before, bird's eye and before any, you know, anything like that, we're going to pretend we're in 1890. Okay. And this is what we're going to do for a couple of weeks. And we're going to just see how it goes. All right. At least mom is going to. And so, you know, what, what, where dad takes you guys when I'm not looking, that's not, that's not uh, my problem, but in the house, we're going to pretend like it's 1890. All right. So we can do a little experiment like that. And, Obviously, if we if we have a hostile environment that can't 
they can't take on an experiment, then that's a whole different level of conflict in that family. But um, that's how I would try to coach somebody into sticking their toe in the water uh, to see what it feels like to probably feel better and also feel the concept that they're making progress. So they want to experience that. I feel like that's the, uh, that, that's the, the chief architect of any, of any uh, long-term success is starting to get a little bit of positive feedback for your efforts. And you need to go long enough that you feel it. That's why you know, the McDougal program was always 10 days in, 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 uh, in house. And that's why the, um, uh, that's why, you know, at true North, uh, people are usually encouraged to, to be there a week or two at least, uh, or at fasting escape a couple of weeks. So we're, we we're looking at something on the order of a week to two weeks to run an experiment, because if we do that, uh, if we do a good job of that, a lot of times we notice some actual physical changes uh, physically that, that uh, are then worth, worth doing it again. So that's how I would do this. Uh, there was another part to her question uh, that I have lost, AJ. Okay, so, I, I think, okay, so there was, uh, she said, oh, well, sorry, I moved it up. Um, how, how can I impart your wisdom that the environment is critical to success why is there such resistance and how can I help them want to do this? Yeah, the, there's a lot of resistance and that resistance is going to come uh, for, for one thing, they can be anticipating conflicts of interest with other people and they don't know how to negotiate those conflicts. And so this is one avenue of negotiating conflicts is to make a short term negotiation out of it so that the other people don't feel like they have to dig their heels in because they're facing a, a lifetime negotiated uh, event. So it's an awful lot easier negotiating uh, your teenager over cleaning up their garage once and what you're going to pay them rather than a, a five-year contract on how we're going to do it. If it's a five-year contract, they're going to get very tough in the negotiations and so are we because we don't want to get stuck with a long-term contract that we don't like. So it's way easier negotiating short-term contracts and long-term contracts. Uh, and so that's, that's why it is that we aim at that. Uh, another reason there's a lot of resistance is that um, the, the pleasure trap by nature is very tenacious. So let me explain to folks why the pleasure trap is so uh, difficult to do. So if you're a health coach out there trying to fight the good fight, you should expect that the vast majority of the people that you work with that pay you money and are motivated to come and try to work this out will not succeed, okay? So now that sounds very grim, uh, but let me explain to you why. And it's not because people are weak and it's not because they're stupid and it's not because they're unmotivated. It's something else. And this is, you know, I, I've been almost a lone voice in the wilderness on this, on this issue uh, because it is not understood. It, it is briefly acknowledged, but it's not understood. So now let me explain it in a new way. I want you to imagine that I'm holding uh, a piece of paper in my hand, which, you know what, I've got AJ. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not sure that, that we, can, we can see this, uh, hold on. Well, we love your visuals, especially when there's artwork involved. Okay, well, it's not much artwork, we're doing this really fast. This is going to be what I call the continuum of value, okay? And so on one side of it is terrible, the other side of it is great, and neutral is in the middle. So I want you to understand that this is what your mind does, is your mind is a device for evaluating your environment. Okay? That's what it does. So if you're, uh, if you're the prettiest girl in a small town, and now another, another a really a, a one one notch prettier girl moves in. That is not a good thing. <laughs> okay, you did this. There's I may, maybe she becomes your best friend, but there's a good chance that this is not a good thing for your uh, situation. Value has to do with a specific uh, problem of life, and the problem of life uh, is uh, the reproduction of DNA. And so it's going to turn out that there are two sub processes for animals 
in order to solve the problem of the reproduction of DNA, which is number one, survive, and number one, reproduce. And so all, all of human instincts uh, and, and animal instincts are nothing other than uh, essentially subsystems uh, that are designed by nature to help that thing happen. So you're, you're sneezing or an itch or hunger drive or temperature regulation or the, the appreciation of beauty in a landscape, the, 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 the attraction of the sound of running water, the, the look of flowers, you know, the taste of an apple, all of those things are positive instinctual feedback mechanisms to tell you that each of those things has a positive relationship between you and your survival and your gene, genetic success. If you are walking in the woods and you're a twig snap, you have anxiety. And that's because that's a, that's a signal from the environment that, that you could be in danger, okay? So this is, the, what your life is, is it, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional system that is resonating to the continuum of value. The most valuable possible thing might be, I don't know, the, the, the day your daughter brings home, uh, you know, an award from school, oh, I don't know, or the day you fall in love or you meet, meet the love of your life. The worst day is, you know, I don't know, uh, the, uh, you know, maybe, uh, uh, maybe you get a pathology report on a cancer that looks really bad. Okay, that could be your worst day or something like that. So in other words, there's, there's very good news and good feedback or good, good indications uh, of, of that this is a good situation for you. There are indications that it's bad and there's everything in between. And when it's in between, it's neutral. So the truth of the matter is there's all kinds of stuff in the environment, most of which you feel pretty neutral about. So I could look around this room Obviously, everything is in this room because it serves some purpose, but a lot of the times it's really pretty neutral. So here, I don't know what this is doing here. <laughs> it's a it's a washcloth, and it's been on my desk for a little while. I, I don't even know why it was here. Okay, the um, I think it yeah somebody I was folding clothes here or something, and that happened to be there. And because it's brown, it looks like the desk. I I left it there and I didn't notice it. I don't know why but it's pretty well useless, pretty close. It has almost no value. So when I look at that, I don't think, oh my God, that's dangerous. Or, oh my God, that's so exciting. I don't look at it that way. I look at it, it has causes almost no emotional reaction at all. Okay, now, if it was something very valuable, then I would have a pleasant reaction yeah, inside my nervous system. If it was a picture of my cat, AJ sent me a picture of my favorite pen, cat, that, uh, cat that I ever had. I, I hang it next to my fireplace. So thank you very much, AJ. I love, I love that picture, all right? So that, if I ever look at that picture, that makes me feel good. If, uh, if there's something, uh, if, if not, that same cat has puked on the rug, then that's bad, okay? The continuum of value causes your feelings to be what they are. Your the nervous system, if you're struggling with, uh, with uh, eating, behavior, uh, change, et cetera, you're a health coach and you're trying to work with people, you have to understand that their life is operating on this continuum of value and that what they want is that they would like to be as attractive and presentable as possible. That's the number one reason they're probably talking to you as a health coach. They may tell you that they're talking to you as a health coach to improve their health, but a big part of what they're probably trying to do is to improve their appearance, okay? Now, they also very well may be highly motivated to improve their health. They may be scared to death about something or they may have some significant pain that they're trying to get rid of. But one way or the other, they, they have some things that they are seeking and their brain says, we need to execute some behaviors in order to accomplish that. The problem is, is that on the continuum of uh, value, there are, the nervous system uh, was designed for all animals to, uh, to try to get as much energy as they could from their food for as little effort as possible. So therefore that means that they have sophisticated signaling devices for taste preferences. Uh, they're gonna tell them that the richest food is the most valuable food, okay? Therefore on the continuum of value, the, the richer food is more valuable. And therefore the nervous systems instinctual machinery is telling them that's absolutely the right thing to do. 
Okay, so for all time, that's always been the right thing to do. And now today we're gonna to tell them, no, that's the wrong thing to do. It's like, wow, oh, okay, I'm just gonna do it differently. Are you kidding me? That's like defying the instinct that says, don't take, don't take a sharp stick and stick it into your ear, okay? okay? You don't need to learn that. You, you, that. you know to not do that. Of course, you can't start doing that. If I told you, oh no, it's really healthy, It'll solve your pancreas cancer if you take a sharp stick and poke it into your ear and really hard so you scream in pain. You're like, really? I don't think, number one, that doesn't make any sense. And number two, that's extremely unpleasant. And I'd say, well, you know, yeah, you got better believe me. That's a fiasco. To try to get you to go directly counter to the instincts. The instincts are super sophisticated, unbelievably trustworthy signals of what's in your best interest. They're incredibly trustworthy. If you're walking in the woods near a twig snap, your instincts are telling you stop right there, turn and look and be ready. And your heart starts beating faster. Okay, just like that immediately. It does that because it's getting ready for a very serious athletic challenge that could be the difference between survival and non-survival for you, okay? So these instincts are unbelievably sophisticated. We don't just override them because we've decided that they're wrong. You're never going to do that. Okay. So what are they really up against? They're up against doing something that is completely unnatural. Nobody ever had to change their eating behavior to become more attractive. Uh, -uh. that is completely an utterly nonsensical concept makes no sense at all. There's no connection in evolution between those two things. Okay? The fact that we can learn that that's true because we've altered the food in the 20th century to the point where people are walking around with varying degrees of disgusting presentations because they're misshapen. They don't look like human beings are supposed to look. Okay? So, they, so therefore there's varying degrees of revulsion on the part of other people. Okay, that's, why, that's why people stand a little further away. Okay, that's why people don't want to hug you. That's all, all these things. Okay, it, it, it's something, now we're not, I mean, those are harsh words I'm using, but I, I don't mean them harshly. I mean, these are basal instinctual processes that go on inside of people. If, they, if they're looking at you, you don't look like the instinctual human being is supposed to look if you're 80 pounds overweight. And so as a result, it's slightly off-putting and disturbing. Okay? For all the Stone Age brain knows, what's wrong with you is you're in a massive inflammatory disease process that could be communicable. That would be a reasonable inference for the Stone Age brain to make. It turns out that if you have a a sore looking thing on your face, uh, I think of a centimeter uh, in size, if they'll put that on your face, uh, a darkened spot that looks like it could be some kind of a pathological process, people will stand further away from you. This has been done in psychological experiments, okay? So the, uh, it's actually substantial, it's like a foot. You know, this is amazing, uh, really interesting experiments that have been done on this. So the point is, is that you're, uh, you are getting a lot of this sort of negative feedback and you want to change that? Yes. And do you actually understand why you're getting the feedback? Yes, you do. You understand that you got passed over for a job or not called back for a date or whatever it is, all kinds of little feedback situations. Okay. Uh, and now, and now your health coach tells you, oh, I've got the solution. Just go directly counter to your value system. Go not just, not just somewhat different from your counter value system, completely opposite of your value system. I want you to go 180 degrees away from your value system. That's about as easy as trying to teach somebody when they're in the woods in the dark and a twig snaps to turn and start running towards the sound, whether you know what it is or not. Okay. So if you're a health coach that's been struggling with this, I hope you now understand and possibly a little bit more graphically why you cannot expect success. There's a, a modest percentage of people 
that have uh, both the intelligence and the motivation uh, and the personality that they can actually take this information and consciously and deliberately grit their way towards going against their instincts for long enough to find out that their instincts are not doing them any good. And in fact, that they can get past them, they can slip past those instincts and that they can get themselves onto a behavioral path that, that gains them some leverage. That's why we're trying to run an experiment, okay? So essentially what this is, if you're a health coach, you're attempting to come up with one, no pun intended, just by accident, palatable experiment after the next. And so one way of making an experiment palatable to change your environment is to uh, tell your spouse and your kids you're running an experiment. Okay, so that's, uh, but you know, there's, I'll run into, you know, the, the person, I'll give them an idea. They won't do it. They'll fiddle around. It's the best idea I had. I'll talk to them three weeks later. They haven't done it. We'll have to then unpack why it is that they didn't do it. I'll say, well, let's, what, what was getting in the way there? And then they'll tell me kind of what was getting in the way. And then we try to problem solve from there and try to maneuver our, our way around that little obstacle. But along, but the entire, uh, process is is one of essential gentle patience and understanding that since you're trying to get people to go 180 degrees opposite of uh, the genetic code we can expect that it's it's unlikely to be successful it's not likely to be easy and once in a while we're going to have some successes we're going to have a lot of obstacles in the way we're likely to have a lot of relapses and we will have some successes some people will succeed and they will succeed brilliantly, and then we'll wonder why everybody doesn't do it. This was mind-blowingly helpful, Dr. Lyle, because I don't think you've ever talked about the value continuum before or actually addressed this question, because I, too, wonder why, why people don't do what, to me, is so obvious. But thank you for explaining it. Very good. Great. All right. All right, so now we actually are going to jump to a dating question. This, like, this is sort of like a beat your jeans. I love when it's, I love when guys send questions because they don't send as many questions as women. So uh, this is a question from Richard. Dear Dr. Lyle, I'm a 62-year-old male who was widowed two years ago. I am well-educated, successful in my career, fit, and told by others that I am a great catch. I'm ready to start dating and the majority of the age appropriate women, 50s and early 60s that I have been meeting, many have never been married and many are still living at home with their mothers. Is it fair for me to disqualify them based on this? I don't mean to be unkind, but I keep thinking that if someone is that age and has never been married and is still living at home, then there must be something wrong with them. Are these legitimate reasons to disqualify someone or am I just being too picky? Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a really good and interesting, uh, there's a broader principle to this question. And, uh, so let me, let me ex explain what the broad principle is. Uh, people behind the energy conservation mechanism, people are looking for what we're going to call correlations. Uh, so correlations are, are, uh, correlations are, are when things go together. Okay, so, so for example, dark clouds and rain. So dark clouds and rain are correlated. Okay? So bright sunshine, hot sunshine, and sunburns are correlated. So you're, uh, they're correlated because there's a causal connection between the two of them. So what we want to do is, uh, as we learn and grow, we can learn correlation coefficients. Now your nervous system has a lot of correlation coefficients embedded in it. So when the twig snaps, uh, you know to feel fear. And when you bite into the apple and it's sour, it's less appealing than the one that's sweet. Those are correlation coefficients to what's good for you. Uh, so that's how that works. And, or if you smell manure, uh, you know, sometimes if there's something that looks like cat puke, uh, and I'm not sure if it's cat, cat puke or cat poop, but I'll lean down and smell it, and then I can tell. <laughs> okay, so the um, so that's uh, your your nervous system is designed by nature to look for correlations, and so what this man is asking for is uh, are these life history uh, situations with these women are these 
correlations that are in fact being caused by something that I don't want to buy. Okay, so that's what, what it is that he's trying to, to establish. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that those correlations may be, they may have some truth in them. In other words, it could be true that people that have never been married have problems with them more often than the person that has been married. That would make sense uh, to some degree. In other words, uh, some, some gal that uh, all things being equal, attractiveness wise, someone that has never been married may be more disagreeable and harder to please. <laughs> okay, so that uh, so undoubtedly that correlation coefficient is legitimate. The question is how legitimate is it? And the answer is not very. It's a little bit legitimate. Okay, so it may may be responsible for making you slightly more accurate in your decisions. If you were going to make a hundred decisions that way, and you had them coming at you very fast, and all you had on a resume really quickly was ever been married or not been married then you might use that if you, you know, along with any other uh, information. Uh, and it's also, do you live with your mother? Okay, well, uh, the truth of the matter is, is some of the people might live with their mothers. Uh, like right now, I live with my mother. Well, actually my mother lives with me, but whatever you wanna call it. Okay, so, uh, so does that make me, you know, sort of a loser? Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, it's actually out of compassion for my mother uh, that that's true. And so, uh, so that makes me potentially uh, have some baggage uh, that would be in the way of some romantic relationship that I might be entering. Because it'd be like, well, sorry, uh, my, my humanity and my connections in my life history have me uh, in love with this little lady. And I'm not going to ship her off to the little nursing home down the street. I'm not going to do it. Okay, not as long as not as long as I can manage it. So that I would hope would not be a rule out, but it would be some. It would be influence the cost benefit of a woman on the other side of that equation looking at my situation, and uh, she might feel like, "Wow, what a nice guy," and therefore that doesn't rule him out. Or she might think, "Oh my God, what a pain in the neck." You know, this is going to be this is going to be in the way of this relationship to some degree of percentage of time and energy. So therefore, uh, I think I don't want to deal with it. Okay. So, what what do we have to say about this? Uh, don't be too quick to look for correlational shortcuts. Okay. So don't do that. In other words, you can you can learn massively more about a human being by sitting across them in a Starbucks drinking tea for an hour than you can by looking through any clues uh, like this to try to help you make a decision. Don't, don't try to look for clues like this. Just meet their humanity, okay? By essentially talking to them for a short period of time, you have ingenious mechanisms inside your nervous system that have been built in there for millions of years to try to help you assess their personalities. And so, uh, whether a, a woman has never been married and lives with her mother, if you meet her and you really like her as a human, take that as by far the most important information. And uh, let's don't be using a superficial shortcut like that. Now, if the guy says to you, ladies, that, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't meet you this week because I got a big infection on my tattoos. I got those tattoos when I was in the joint. You know, I just got released a few weeks ago. <laughs> if that's happening, then you might, the joint being the prison, uh, you might want to pass on that. That's probably a pretty good set of correlations for you to, uh, to uh, give credence to, but uh, not this. So be quite open-minded and meet the person's humanity and let those instincts tell you uh, what, what you want to do about that uh, possible opportunity. Okay. okay, terrific. All Thank right. you. All right. Uh, but uh, where did this one go? This was about, uh, yeah, okay. This is from Leslie. Uh, Dr. Lyle, I've heard you say that you're not a fan of gastric bypass surgery. I'm wondering how you feel about the newer non invasive weight loss surgeries like the gastric balloon, aspiration therapy, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, 
and gastric injections. These are not permanent and carry much lower risk. Do you think these are of any use as a good idea to kickstart someone's weight loss and affect behavioral change? No, I think they're a bad idea. Um, I, I, I would, I am open to, uh, you know, if my friend Michael Greger tells me that he's just reviewed a bunch of research, <laughs> which he likes to do, and he comes and he says, okay, Doug, it turns out that there's this or that percentages of this, and like, okay, I'll look at it. But as of today, I would categorically uh, reject anything like that. And by the way, I don't know that Michael's ever commented on anything like that. So I'm, I'm just I'm just making a joke about about his research, you know, fanaticism. The um, I, I stand open to the evidence, and so I don't want to uh, take a stand that I wouldn't be willing to reverse if there was evidence that was compelling to me. Um, my my experience clinically with these things has been uh, consistent feedback indicating a bunch of trouble. Uh, and I think that the truth of the matter is, is that I have uh, confidence. Uh, I, I can think of, I can think of a few cases. Uh, I can think of one case in my career, one. Okay, so it's been a long career in this arena. I can think of one case in my career where somebody that had absolutely exceptional diligence uh, in her behavior uh, was was able to at best get down to moderately obese. That was an extremely unusual genetic structure, okay? and there are such people on Earth. So the uh, but those people number the, the typical numbers are on the order of one in ten thousand. Okay, so they are extremely unusual uh, char characteristics. This is um, the vast majority of people. If they eat healthy diets, uh, if they eat, eat a, a natural food oriented healthy diet, they are going to lose copious amounts of weight and they're going to wind up at a very acceptable uh, weight level. Uh, so that, that's how that works. The, um, now, for the outlier, for a true outlier, that would be an, that's an interesting question. Uh, since, I've, since I've only had one, that individual did not choose to do anything like that. She was a highly intelligent, highly conscientious individual and decided to just live with uh, the, the results that she gets from doing a good job. And that's that, you know, good, good for her, I, I respect that. Had she said to me, you know what, I'm gonna do one of these gizmo things and I'm gonna try to see if that'll help me lose another 50 pounds, I would have said, you know what, not unreasonable. I don't know that it's going to work. We never know because we never know that the nervous system is so brilliant. It's such a redundant system that if you start to lean on one system very often, it's essentially treated by the DNA like an injury. And then it just starts weaving its way around that injury. And then it compensates in some through some other subsystem and they wind up right back where they started. Okay. So that is very uh, characteristic of many people that have had many of these types of uh, invasive processes take place. So she is, so she decided being well aware that that was a possibility that she didn't want to be doing e either permanent damage or just wind up with a situation where she had temporary results for a year and then the system started to work its way around the, the impediment. She didn't want to go through that merry-go-round. So she decided, you know what, I'm just going to live with it. And I complete respect for that. Uh, also great compassion. It's like, God, what do you have to do, you know, but she lost, she went from 360 pounds down to about 220 uh, by doing her diet properly. So that was a, that was as good a victory as we could get with an outlier. So that's my attitude. Uh, in other words, these things are uh, guilty until utterly proven innocent. And I'm not going to believe any short-term feedback. I want to see what that looks like on an individual five years after it's been used. And I want to look for longer term evidence of, of side effects and damage and the, the, the entire cost. So yeah, I'm not likely to be changing my opinion anytime soon, but I do stand open to uh, particularly the use with 
with the extraordinarily rare outliers. Okay, so everybody else, my attitude is, hey, don't, don't be monkeying with a precious system. It was, you know, God-given system that it needs to be operated the way it was designed. Okay, that, that's our challenge. And it is a big and difficult challenge, but that is the challenge we need to be focused on, I believe. I think that's the right way to do it. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, you have so many nice comments. Cheryl says, thank you for this great information. Dr. Lyle, Karen says, I love that he is so sensible and kind. I could listen to his logic all day. That's why I said we should have Lyle TV. Like just, I'll just, I'll sit here 24 hours and, and talk to you. It'd be amazing. So here's a, this is a poignant question. And uh, I didn't want to start with it because it made me feel a little sad just reading it from Joanne. Dear Dr. Lyle, if you have reached an age and a stage in life where it is unlikely that your dreams will ever come true, is it best to stop pursuing them and just settle for the fact that this may be as good as it gets? And if doing that is truly in our best interest, how do we ever reconcile the sadness that comes from our lives not working out the way we hoped and planned? To give you some context, I'm a well-educated female approaching 50 who is still unmarried, still overweight, and not where I want to be in my career. I find that trying to be successful in all three of these arenas only gets harder as I age, and I'm afraid I'm going to die alone. Yeah. Okay. So let's see what we can learn from this. The um, unpleasant feelings um, are... Uh, particularly of this stamp, you can have an unpleasant feeling because you've got you know, bacteria in your stomach that are making you vomit. The, um, but unpleasant feelings that, of the type that she is describing are, um, are the result of a discrepancy between what we think we should be able to achieve and what we are in fact achieving. And so the, 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 the nervous system is built essentially like a thermostat. It's an emotional thermostat. So, so I want you to imagine if you are working at a job and then you find out that your friend works at a similar job at a different firm and he's being paid $25 an hour and you're being paid $18 an hour. Um, so now you were okay with your pay until you find this out. And now that you find this out, you find yourself a little bitter, a little irritated and motivated to go to the other firm or to tell your boss you need a raise and you feel kind of angry and assertive and frustrated, okay? It may even cause you to get passive aggressive at your work. In other words, a whole bunch of things start happening in your nervous system when you find out that there's a discrepancy between what you are getting and what you think you deserve. There's a, that is a natural state of the organism to be uncomfortable and feel frustration under the situation where the brain has evidence that it should be here in terms of its feedback from the village and instead it is here, okay? So that discrepancy is what drives that system. Uh, sometimes we can do things about, about it, sometimes we can't. So for example, we might have um, back pain and it may uh, turn out that we've had, we've been in situations where we didn't have the back pain. And so there's a discrepancy between we know, we know how we can feel physically and how we feel physically and is tremendously frustrated uh, about that. And we can we can get help, we can go to a chiropractor, we can, uh, you know, I've just learned that some back pain may be the result of some bacterial, you know, processes that are going on in, in, in the spine and that can, that may be able to be corrected uh, by various uh, interventions. So that's sort of a new idea. I guess it's been around for a while, but it's new to me. So the point is, is that there, there could be things that you can do, but if you've done everything that you can do, and you still have the back pain, you're still gonna be frustrated, okay? Now, the, um, so what I'm about to say is not magical because it won't necessarily like a magic wand fix uh, the, what this person is describing. However, it's the closest thing we've got. So now I'm going to tell you that 
uh, how, how the mind works. But, uh, that feeling of discrepancy of what it is that we deserve, uh, that, that bar is set by rational processes of observing our environment and looking at what competitive uh, people competitive to us have achieved and feeling like that's a reasonable target, okay? So if you are, um, oh, I don't know, let's suppose you're a bright young person with a degree and you've got your, your uh, dietitian and you feel like, well, I should be able to earn enough money to have my own nice apartment in Tucson and, uh, and that I should, you know, uh, get be reasonably respected by the little medical staff. Like these are reasonable expectations. Okay. So if those things aren't happening for some reason, then we should feel frustration until that thing gets corrected. That frustration drives us to make efforts to try to close the distance between what we are getting here and what we think we should be getting. And but what we should be getting is set by very sophisticated comparison algorithms that, that are in, instinctual in your head. You look around and you see who can do what in the village and whether or not you can do it in the village. And then you set your course accordingly. So I didn't, I never, I never looked at the, the big bruising guys that were getting to wear the football uniforms around high school. that were 220 pounds. And I didn't say to myself, well, I should be able to be on the football team. No, I didn't. I recognize that. Okay. So I didn't, you know, if I went to the dances and I saw a few of these guys could just smoke up the floor because they had incredible coordination and they just had a self-possession and cool. I didn't think to myself, well, I should be able to do that. Okay. In other words, we don't, we don't all think that we're going to be Barry Manilow or Joe Montana or Lady Gaga. We don't set our sights there. We set our sights at what looks reasonable about what we should reasonably be able to achieve. And this woman has undoubtedly set her sights at reasonable levels, and yet she's here. Ah, that's very important, okay? So now what our problem is that there's, a, there's a, a journey of achievement that needs to go to take us from here to here. And that's a process, and that process uh, is it's not easy because the person has already tried and they have gotten a lot of failure feedback and they have not, they, they have not been able to uh, traverse that. And now, so the, the painful feelings of loss and frustration and loneliness and fear about all that, that's all reasonable, okay? Those are all reasonable feelings telling you they're trying to motivate you to cross that divide. Now, so our job is to work on crossing the divide. And that job means identifying the fundamentals that our competitors have mastered better than we have, that have taken them to a place where they've been in a more competitive situation, where they were then able to get better trading processes in work, friendship, romance, et cetera, okay? So our job is to do that. And as we work on those fundamentals, what happens is that a very important part of our pain starts to fade. So our pain, our, our feelings actually come as a result of two different processes. And this is gonna involve the discussion that AJ uh, told people that we had, uh, oh, on the summit, okay? so. This is now, I'm not gonna recap the summit. I'm just, I'm gonna recap a tiny portions of it that are important. There are two different feelings that are super important with respect to our happiness. One of those feelings is what I call self-esteem. The other feeling is what I call self-confidence. Those are different things. And people are sloppy with the language and psychologists are sloppy conceptually. They don't actually understand that these are two completely independent uh, phenomenon. Now, so let's look at this. Self-esteem is what happens to us. Uh, Self-esteem is a feedback feeling that comes as an internal audience observes our efforts and gives us feedback on what it thinks of our effort, not on our accomplishment, on our effort. Okay. 
So if our effort is diligent and excellent, even if our feedback or our progress is not high or it's low or it's zero, then what happens is we'll feel frustration and we will not feel a rising confidence. Confidence is an enormous lever of happiness. It's a huge lever. Self-esteem is a smaller lever, but it's a critical one. And now the, um, the greatest pain that we're ever going to feel really is not a lack of self-confidence. Self-confidence is what happens when we know that our presentation and what it is that we have to trade is going to get good feedback from the village. We know it's going to get good feedback from the village. We can already tell because we're getting good feedback from the village. Or we can see that our presentation is just as good as someone else who is getting good feedback from the village. So that feeling of confidence, there's no feeling like confidence. Confidence is where the rubber hits the road in evolution because real live people are real live giving us good feedback. They're real live saying that they want to date us and they want to be with us. They're real live telling us that they want to hire us, and that they want to hire us again. They real live are saying that they want to be our friend and hang out with us. There is no feeling like confidence. Okay. That is not the same thing as self-esteem. Self-esteem is the feeling that comes with knowing that you did an excellent job. You did your best. Okay. If you work diligently at a project that you know is standing between you and the positive feedback that will result in self-confidence and the enjoyment of superior relationships. If you work diligently at those fundamentals, your internal audience will tell you, I respect you. Okay, I respect you. Well done. Okay, hey, it sucks that we may not be getting better feedback, but we have inner peace of knowing that we've done the best we could. When you don't have that inner peace, you are really, you're hurting three times as much. I can tolerate negative feedback. I can tolerate the frustration of not getting the feedback that I want to and think that I could get to. I can tolerate that if I give it my best and they don't like it that much, okay? Um, I can live with it. it it's not, it doesn't feel good, the, uh, but, it, but I can tolerate it. I can give you an example as an author. When I wrote The Pleasure Trap, um, Alan being Alan, because he's inherently optimistic. <laughs> Alan was like, oh, this is going to be big. This is going to be big. This is going to, it's like, well, The Pleasure Trap did not sell very well. It's a pleasure trap. Uh, had we been with a mainstream publisher, they would have stopped the print of the pleasure trap within a couple of years. It man, wouldn't have been worth doing. Now, I gave that book my best. And when I go back and I read it, I have an experience. It's like, yeah, yeah, somebody got it right. <laughs> so the point is, is I look at that with pride. Okay. And when it was not selling well, and it never did sell well. It sells better now than it ever did. So it's had a tremendously long life as a book, and it's now finally done what you would consider well, thanks to AJ. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, AJ. You, you've probably been our, bi our biggest and best promoter. The, um, the point is, is that <clears throat> even though I could feel disappointment in the first couple of years after its publication, um, I, I still had completely intact self-esteem about it. I still had pride with my effort and what, what I accomplished. And the fact that the market was not biting at it, it's like, I can live with that. I don't like it. I wish that it had been more successful at the time. I can remember that, but it's like, I can live with it. Okay. And we went on, on radio shows and we promoted it and we talked about the concepts and it's like, listen, these are, and Alan, I think it was Alan that finally one day it dawned on him. He said, you know, Doug, we are selling against the pleasure trap. We're actually telling people if they work really hard and do something that they really don't want to do, then they may get some benefit out of it. That is like the ultimate exact opposite of the way you sell things. What you tell people is that they can do something that they exactly want to do that's going to be really fun and tasty and that they're going to get all this benefit. I, the chocolate diet. 
I think that was the day he said, yeah, it was, if it was the chocolate diet, we would have sold a bunch of books, okay? And of course, yes, selling ants a pleasure drop is the toughest thing to do. Well, so anyway, the long, the long answer to this is the following. Probably your pain is being tripled by the fact that we have not consistently done the diligent effort to earn self-esteem. When you do that, and you can do that, you can start to earn self-esteem and see a change in a matter of days, okay? So the notion is to be an expert at learning how your own internal mind works, how your, how your feedback system, how your feeling system and emotion system works. And the way it works is when you do a diligent effort, even if you're bitter, because you feel like you're probably not gonna be successful, but if you do the fundamentals as well as you can identify them, as well as you can, if you do them hard and do the hard things, you will find that you feel better about yourself, okay? And that is the solution to that problem. The truth is you can die alone. A lot of people can die alone. You can spend the last third of your life alone. A lot of people spend the last third of their life alone but it will hurt three times as much if you didn't do your job. We can't just be at peace and inner peace by sitting back and saying, boy, life hasn't treated me well. I haven't had, gotten a break. You got plenty of breaks, right? You got plenty of breaks. You were born in the United States of America. You're, you're living in a free society, whether you're born here or not, you're here, okay? Or wherever you're listening to this. You're probably in a place that has a great deal of freedom, a great deal of prosperity, and you don't have to face the horrors of what people faced in the 19th century and every time before. You're, the world is your oyster. You have great opportunity. You have great opportunity for self-improvement. And the beauty of the human mind is your internal mechanisms didn't set the goals so high. They actually set them very reasonably. Your job is to do the inconvenient, difficult, and unpleasant process of working the fundamentals harder at what are standing between you and there, okay? The solution to finding a mate is to work on, your, uh, on yourself, on the deficiencies in your presentation to the point where you've made yourself into the best presentation that you can and then just act natural. I'm not gaming anybody, okay? You're, you're, you, you become the best version of you. That's what you do, okay? When you do that, if the market doesn't like it and you can't find a partner, you can live with that, okay? Um, but, but you can't live with it very well with the notion that you didn't do your part of it. That you do need to do, okay? So that, that's the solution to the inner peace is to, uh, to, to work on the things that are stopping you. Wow. I okay. It's just, I love listening to you. I mean, so like when you go to the Academy, well, not when you go to the Academy Awards, I've never been, but when you watch them, obviously not everyone wins. And so when the actors say it's just an honor to be nominated, did they mean that because they did their best work? Because it seems like uh, they really want to win. Absolutely. And you'll find some personality differences. And, you know, and I've, I've listened to some of those speeches and they're interesting. I listened to Cher said, no, I have to win. That's like, like, good, you know, good for her and she won and all, all is well. But, um, but the truth of the matter is um, that is exactly how those people feel. What a tremendous honor. It's like, hey, at the end of the day, you, your, uh, uh, John Wooden had a saying, and I won't get the quote exactly right. But the saying was, if you've done your best, you've won doesn't matter what the score is. If you've done your best, you've won. And that's how we have to look at this. So that includes fighting down and the imperfections that are gonna come uh, inevitably from fighting a thing as hard as we're talking about and, and choking down the ego trap and doing your best you can uh, and not just kicking over the table. And if you do, picking up your yourself again and trying again, okay? so. Uh, you know, that, that's what we're here for. We are here to assist you in a very, very difficult struggle. Uh, can't, you know, the geneticists will tell us that 80% of the variance in weight is genetic, okay? 
John McDougall will blow his stack. I don't think he's ever heard me say that, but if he did, he would blow his stack for good reason, because um, that is true. And you can measure that in behavior genetic studies, but that doesn't mean your genes are your destiny. That just means that they provide a tremendous challenge and obstacle. That doesn't mean that they are your destiny. Your, uh, <clears throat> your uh, whether or not you are fit, look good, and, get, and can essentially present your best self uh, to the world in, in that romance arena, that is actually up to you. And that, that is the, the, all the little tidbits of details and fundamentals that AJ and I have been talking about for years, okay? That's what we do, and we look for the self-esteem that comes with doing those along the way. The thing that I want everybody to know is your self-esteem can change dramatically in a matter of days. Your weight can't, but your self-esteem can. And that's the, the most important correlation coefficient for you to realize is that you, the feeling of earning your own self-respect is the most important part of that journey. Wow. I, I've been Googling John Wooden quotes. Is this the one that you had in mind, Dr. Lyle, the one that says, success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing you did your best to become the best you you are capable of becoming? That sums it all up. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Great. Well, um, would you like to end now? Because it's, uh, oh, uh, what's our situation? We have a few more minutes or no? Well, for you, we have a few more hours, but I always like to respect the time. Um, oh, no, let, let, let's take another question. Okay. So I, I, like I say, I normally prioritize the one sent in, but there's this one live that has caught my eye, especially because we started out talking about the environment. And it's from Carrie who says, my 86 year old mom is hundred pounds overweight and is addicted to ice cream. She can eat a carton or two per day. She begs me to buy it four cartons at a time, which I won't do anymore and says it's her only joy in life and will be dying soon. Any suggestion? <laughs> yeah, eat the ice cream. You know, let's, let's, let's get realistic now. So we, we have our own personal goals and we have our own personal vision of what it is that we want our specific life to be. And, um, you know, the thing that came out of the, the women's movement, I think in the 1970s is that, you know, we own our bodies. Okay. Yeah. You own your body and they own theirs. So her, her mother owns her body. So it's, you know, this is a, this is a situation where at 86 years old, she's not capable of driving to the store herself and buying it for herself. So you know, this would be a reasonable thing for us to do. I would honor her wishes. Um, and you might, you might want to fiddle and experiment with her and see if you could get her to have soy ice cream instead, uh, because it might be just a little bit healthier, but no, I would not, uh, I would not be trying to, uh, uh, any more than you've already done and try to influence that process. Wow. See that I wouldn't do it, and not just because I won't buy people animal products. I mean, I'd buy. Right. I guess I would buy somebody crap if I had to in that situation, but I wouldn't. Yeah. I just wouldn't buy animal products. I understand. I understand that, but uh, but uh, I, I would. I would. I mean, I, I have great compassion for the animals, but but uh, your yours and my commitment to that, as people will have, is going to be on a continuum, and uh, I'm up there pretty high, but I'm not at the same level that you are, so. That's why I would, I'd roll my eyes and buy the ice cream, but I would try to sell them on the soy if I could. That sounds great. Well, you're wonderful, Dr. Lyle. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, one more, AJ. Okay. Well, okay. We said we weren't going to get into political questions, but there's a part of this question that's not political, but if you, if you don't want to take it, you won't, but it, okay. it's, it's from Jen and it was, how do you be friends with people who voted differently? And it's not so much about the election, but to me, the bigger question is, is how do you be friends with people that completely disagree with you? That's what I'm seeing in the question. Boy, you know, that's, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And um, these, uh, uh, we, we will get into things like this. Uh, Jen Hawk and I will talk about that, you know, on, on podcasts and, uh, at a living with some library, we, we do a couple times a month. We do in-house uh, 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 in-house 
Q and A's where we will take take on questions like this. So this is very interesting. So let me try to give you a relatively quick answer. Your your instincts are actually uh, were built for a different time. So your instincts were built uh, as uh, were entirely built uh, as hunter gatherers in Sub-Saharan Africa, and so that hunter gatherer lived in small troops. Uh, probably rarely more than 50. And so uh, we, we actually see some evidence that at 150, things start breaking apart uh, in human psychology. They, they don't like coalitions that large. So in all probability, these were relatively small coalitions, 50 or so. And those coalitions had to make decisions about how they were going to do things. Uh, whether whether the men were going to band together and go to war from the other, on the other guys on the other side of the river, whether or not we're going to go south uh, when the weather changes, or we're going to go to the east. Um, it's, uh, how we're going to, you know, I, I don't know, uh, other processes of negotiation, how we're going to deal with the fact that we've suddenly got a big, strong, would-be alpha male who is harassing some females sexually or, or stepping over the line, and he, he he's he's sort of well-liked and charismatic, but he's a problem. And now he's done something that, that, we, that, that a bunch of us feel like he needs to be excommunicated, but he's not going to go quietly, okay? So this is, there are problems in the Stone Age village. These problems are political. Uh, politics is about how, we, how are we going to deal with the conflicts that arise out of living in the group? The group is extremely advantageous to live in. It's an insurance scheme. It's a mating pool. It's, it's, it's a, a way to trade and get uh, benefits of, of, of exchange and, and expertise. Uh, you know, one woman can, can look after four women's kid while those four women go and harvest something that's difficult to harvest, but they have to be around possibly dangerous situations and they don't want to bring their children there. Or somebody wants to go romancing with a lover, but they need to have their couple of kids looked at while well, that's true. So there are tremendous advantages of group living. But the problem is, is that there's conflicts in group living. And so how we resolve the conflicts in group living is politics. That is what politics is about. It's about what are we going to do? What's fair? We've got conflicts of interest here. Uh, we got rules. Yeah, but now the rules don't seem like the right. We need to change the rules. So here's the problem. In the Stone Age, you were, if you were an adult, you were one of 25 adults or 20 adults in that village, which means if you're one of the women, you're one of the 10 women. And if you're one of the men, you're one of the 10 men. Okay. Not very many people. You're related to a couple of them. So one of them is your brother. So you got your brother in the village and then you've got a sister-in-law in the village, okay? And some people in the village have conflicts with people on the other side of the river, but you've got a sister on the other side of the river and two nephews, okay? You got conflicts. Now, so it's gonna turn out that in the Stone Age village, you if you really wanted something to happen, you probably had a lot of say in whether that's the way it goes down. So, and those, those decisions were super important uh, to your life. It could be life and death kind of decisions. And so you, you were working your political capital and you let people know, this is important to me. Listen, I know you don't care about this. You're my brother, you're, you're not into this, but that son of a bitch cheated my kid, okay? And therefore, I want him out, or I want him publicly humiliated, or I want something, okay? Because that's not going to fly. And if you're my brother, you got to freaking be with me on this, okay? So you see that there are, within the group, there are sub-coalitions, and there are factions. That's how that's going to work. And they're shifting around. They're not always stable, okay? Some of them are real stable. Uh, but you could have a husband and wife in a village and they and their local little people close to them, their, their children or their brothers and sisters, et cetera, they are a big voting block in the coalition. They comprise, they control seven votes out of 24. 
that's a big deal. Okay. So, however, you know, nine years later, that pair bond breaks up. Why somebody cheated somebody and it's a big issue. And now that whole political coalition is in trouble. Now, now we don't know who's lined up with who and there's high drama. So here's what this whole thing is about, what I'm trying to tell you. What I'm trying to tell you is your Stone Age instincts are telling you that political differences between people you know and like that are actually on your team in life, political differences at the national level of the United States government, those actually feel to you like they are very important issues in the village and that you must have solidarity. And if you don't have solidarity, you're freaking against me. You're against me on something super important. But that is an illusion. Okay, That is a vast illusion. National politics in the United States have absolutely almost nothing to do with your existence. Okay, You think they have something to do with your existence. They have little tiny pieces to do with your existence. I've lived through, I counted them at one point, I don't know, eight presidents. What are we going to go? Like I, I, was al I was alive in Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden. Thir is that 13 presidents? I don't know what, is it? I think it is. 13 presidents have come and gone. 12 have come and gone. One of them is now still here. Okay. What do I, does my, was my knife really good when that man was bad with that man good and that and then bad with that because of national policy? Absolutely not. Okay. The beauty of the United States and a democratic republic like this is that the government has become quite irrelevant in the lives of people. Okay, now with COVID, no nah, big deal, I guess it is. You know, there's like laws about what we have to do in, in the face of a pandemic. But the truth is, it's still not that big a deal. By far the major factor in your life are the relationships that you deal with every day. The people you trade with, the people that are in your house, your kids, the, your close coalition your Stone Age village. And you are making a huge mistake if you think that the people in your Stone Age village need to be in solidarity with you about national politics. That's a huge mistake, okay? So national politics, national political figures, a huge amount of what causes us to like or dislike people does not tend to be their policies or the implications of those policies because usually those things are unbelievably minor in your existence. They have more to do with personality characteristics than anything else. So now we're talking about personalities, for God's sakes. Personalities that won't have any influence on your life at all. So really, this winds up being an argument among friends about whether or not you think, you know, whether you like Brad Pitt and Willie Mays. Or Willie Mays is the best player in baseball history. No, he's not. Like, we're going to argue about that? <laughs> what a shame to argue about that. So for me, political process is more, for people that I agree with, we enjoy each other's company talking about it because it's tickling, uh, it's tickling Stone Age instincts to feel like, yeah, we're in solidarity. Not that it means anything. As a libertarian, Every single one of my candidates has lost forever. I have never won an election. <laughs> Not once, okay? So I like to, to me, I shrug my shoulders. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in policies that come and go. Those are, those are mildly interesting to me. They're not very important, okay? They really don't influence my life very much. The, um, so, do I have feelings about it? Yes. Does it tickle my instincts? Yes. Do I recognize that I absolutely love, admire, and respect people on different ends of the political spectrum for me? I better since I meet almost no one that agrees with me. Okay. I got a few friends and we're, we're not too different, but
But I remember one of my good friends one day, he hadn't even talked about politics once we started talking. It's like, oh, and he's disagreeing with me. He's trying to school me. <laughs> that was hilarious. And I just got irritated with him more for the fact that he was trying to school me rather than, than the fact that he disagreed with me. I understood why he disagreed. Like he, he, had a, he had a misunderstanding about the nature of economics. And it turned out I knew a hell of a lot more about economics than he did, but he thought he knew. He's a little arrogant. And over the years, uh, he's modified his position on a few things because he now knows better, okay? Uh, he wouldn't have known that I'd made a major study of economics in my early 20s and I was an econ major. And I was inherently fascinated with it. So my opinions were extremely well informed and his weren't. Okay. But did we break up a friendship over it? Are you kidding? What difference does it make what I think? Nobody in the world's governments anywhere cares and nobody's ever going to implement anything that I would implement. Okay. So for goodness sakes, people, don't let this instinct derail your life and mess up your relationships. These people that you like and that you love have their own personality reactions to uh, people in national government elections like this last one. And those, those feelings may be very strong, okay? But they have absolutely nothing to do with your life. So for God's sakes, love the people that you love, respect the fact that they've got some, some uh, emotional connection to Brad Pitt or Angelina or Willie Mays or or it's Trump, or it's Biden, or it's Obama, whatever. I don't care. I can respect the fact that that's the emotional connection that they have and look right past it and love them. And that's what we should do. Wow. I, you're a, I don't even know what to say. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you're, anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. All right. My great pleasure, AJ. Yeah. Should we tell people what, what we're up to for next month to give them a little uh, excitement here? I don't even know what we're up to. What are we up to? Okay. Well, so next month, instead of appearing with Dr. Hawk, she's going to do a solo mm -hmm. and you're going to come on with Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Oh, that's right. And the reason is, is because you are going to be the, the show, believe it or not, the show's almost a year old. I had no idea I was going to be broadcasting every day for a year, thanks to the pandemic. And I thought, well, episode uh, or season two, who do I want for the first episode? And since I couldn't decide between you, I said, maybe we could have both of you. And you both said yes. And it was really kind of funny because I had emailed uh, uh, Dr. Goldhammer and he, he just, he forgot that he was coming on with you. And he said, okay, this is the PowerPoint. I said, well, are you sure you want to do a PowerPoint if Dr. Lyle's going to be there? He goes, oh, I forgot. I go, maybe you guys want to just do something fun. And he wrote me back and it said, no fun is good. And I didn't know if he meant that no amount of fun is good or no comma fun is good. So I actually had to call him up. He said he forgot the comma. So he does want to do something fun with you. <laughs> that is that is so priceless. Uh, a Freudian would say that was no accident. No fun is good. That sounds just like Alan. Well, what that. That's what I thought. So guys, make sure you mark your calendar for March 21st, uh, episode one of season two, none other than kicking it off with my two favorite people. So thanks a lot, Dr. Lyle. I really love having you on. Absolutely. It's a pleasure, AJ. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure. And thanks all of you so much for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. If you're free in 45 minutes, I'm doing a free cooking demo. I posted the link. And please come back tomorrow. We have the dynamic duo from Slave Food, Dr. Columbus Batiste and Dr. Eric Walsh. Thanks, Dr. Lyle. Bye-bye. Bye, Pat.